campus where they're even closer together. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm trying to get out of this. <laughs> See, I think of that. Convenient. She, I, had, I don't have my hair down a lot, so she was probably under it, fluffing it out, and it stick, holding it back, and she was close to my neck, and she had her eyes were <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they could tell I was getting ready to go out with the boys were. Six. I, I could never get the dates right. 
as an urban park ranger in the New York City parks. So next time you're feeling a little challenged by trying to get your students, just ask yourself, New York City teenagers in the urban parks, get them excited about birds and bugs and compost. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Simons, the deputy director of the Urban Park Rangers in New York, when he was her supervisor, also read her letter for her graduate application here and ranked her in the top 10 of the hundreds of park rangers whom he has worked with over the years and cited her hard work, attitude, intelligence, and raw talent. She also served during that time uh, as the education director of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum, which is in the New York City parks, and sees thousands and thousands of visitors a year. She subsequently attended York College to take some courses um, that she probably should have been forced to take as an undergrad at St. Olaf, and then went on to earn an MA in biology teaching at uh, SUNY Stony Brook where I met her. And I'm just going to I'm just going to jump uh, uh, to the whole question of Holly's teaching our program. Very very well prepared not only to teach herself but to be a resource for the people around her and I can say absolutely honestly that I have learned as much about teaching from Holly as she has probably learned from me about almost anything. She has been fantastic to have in this program. She not only um, did an excellent job herself teaching, she in the last year won not only our departmental EEB graduate student teaching award, she won the university, the whole UConn, let me make sure I get the title right, UConn Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning's graduate teaching award, which is a campus-wide, highly out-competed graduate instructors in every discipline on this campus to win that award. And it really shows. She also created a lot of new, valuable teaching materials while she was here, including having created an entire module for graduate classes in teaching privilege in conservation biology, which subsequently got published in conservation biology Conservation Biology Journal. She is prepared to teach and has a greater commitment to teaching other people what she knows than anybody I have ever encountered. So, in her first year in our graduate program, she went off to OTS, um, a tropical environment, first trip there, which I think blew her mind and taught her a lot about putting together a research project. She did eight short projects in eight weeks while she was at OTS. And in addition to the work that um, you're going to see her do today, she acquired $91,565 in grants and fellowships, including a prestigious research fellowship from the Smithsonian Institution. Um, she has been invited to um, in-person interviews for faculty positions already, where she um, was competing with people who already have years of postdoc experience, which is a testament to how exciting her research <coughs> program is. She mentored five undergraduate scholars here, including two McNair scholars, one of whom is now in an NIH graduate fellowship, and created a wildly successful outreach program at um, Wyndham High School called Ask a Scientist, which takes grad STEM students into the, the classrooms at Wyndham High School. Um, not so much to talk directly about science itself, but to give those students an opportunity to talk to people about their experiences in getting into science and inspire them to feel that they can do science too. That program has been so successful that Holly is currently talking to the UConn uh, Office of Public Engagement, who is interested in turning it into a UConn branded formal program across all of STEM and expanding it to more high schools. I could not be more proud to have worked with this person. She has been an inspiration all through her program 
She's a wonderful scholar, and I know a lot of you in the room know that she is a steadfast and inspiring friend. Holly Brown. Again, let's just say you compensate for glint, 
you correct for refraction, and you somehow manage to not be directly detected by your prey. You still have the problem that you're not invisible, right? You cast a <laughs> shadow, and so you are going to be indirectly detectable, quite possibly. So in this video, I'm gonna show as the shadow of a bird passes through, all right, and right behind the shadow, and I'll let it loop around again, Right as the shadow passes overhead, you can see these fish having a response there. <laughs> so essentially what I'm saying to you is that it seems absurd that any animal would specialize at this interface. And yet, 50 million years ago, birds became some of the most successful invaders of this cross-media hunting niche. And the goal of my dissertation has been to figure out some of their secrets. How do they do it? In order to study these questions, I just work with herons. They're great model animals. They, of course, are cross-media predators, so they have strikes that start in the air and end in the water. They're diurnal, so they're having to deal with the problems of glint and casting shadow over their prey. They're visual hunters. So any visual problems that they encounter must be compensated for in order for them to hunt successfully. They're also conspicuous. So they're relatively easy to locate and observe in the field. And they're successful. Um, and the evidence of that is in that they are so widespread, they have almost a global distribution. The first challenge that I chose to investigate was how parents might compensate for glint. So in this, in this case, it seems that the easy way to compensate for glint is just to avoid it altogether, right? Just to turn the other way. All right, so in this case, the heron strike zone would be directed away from the sun, but we know, right, or we recall from the video that prey sometimes exhibit shadow response, right? Whereby they flee when shadows of predators pass overhead. So I predicted that herons would face generally away from, but not directly opposite to the sun while foraging over water. It turns out that there is another group of folks who is interested <coughs> in both minimizing glint and self shadow in their strike zone. And that's folks who are involved in optical oceanography who are doing remote sensing of the aquatic environment. So they need to minimize glint and self-shadow in the field of view of their remote sensing equipment. And they found that the optimal angle or bearing to the sun at which to do this is about 135 degrees to the sun. Turns out that brown pelicans actually do this. So I predicted that herons, while facing or while foraging over open water, would face at an average of about 135 degrees to the sun. In order to test those predictions, I collected 279 instantaneous samples of 67 free living foraging herons opportunistically while driving through southern Florida. On site, I noted date, time, and location in order to later retrieve exact sun position information from NOAA's online solar calculator. I then estimated heron body orientation with respect to the sun every two minutes, or excuse me, I estimated their body orientation every two minutes for up to 10 minutes or until the bird flew away. I also noted sun visibility and cloud cover, as well as whether or not the heron's shadow was obstructed by anything like emergent vegetation. So first, I'm going to show you all of the data. Here on the x-axis, we have sun elevation, with zero meaning that the sun is low in the sky, so the sun is out on the horizon, and 90 meaning the sun is directly overhead. And then heron orientation with respect to the sun is on the y-axis. So zero meaning the heron is facing into the sun, and 180 meaning currents facing opposite to the sun. And here's what we, oh, excuse me, here's what we predicted. 
right, that they would face an average of about 135 degrees from the sun. And here's what we found. <laughs> yeah, that's how I found. <laughs> so you may recall that it was important in our predictions that both the sun and the heron shadow were visible. Right? So I took out all instances where these uh, conditions were not met, and here is how the graph looked after one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right? So the graph thinned substantially. However, the lack of pattern is still apparent. And in fact, the p-value is almost one there, right? So herons are orienting randomly with respect to sun position. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, actually um, given some good advice by one of my committee members, uh, Heidi Dearson, to go ahead and try to estimate the glint that would be directed toward the heron at any given body orientation, right? So um, we used radiative transfer models, and what these do is they allow you to predict um, the light and um, the, the, the amount of light and the spectra that would be directed toward uh, a sensor of some kind. And normally, what people are interested in when they're doing remote sensing in an aquatic environment is what's under the water surface. Right? So the corals, the algae, um, et cetera. So what they're doing is they're, they're looking for the emitted light, the water leaving radiance, and they're often uh, getting rid of the reflected light. We were interested in using this method in kind of a novel context to instead look at the reflected, the surface reflected radiance or the glint that was directed toward inherent. So here is a graph. It's exactly the graph that you um, saw before, but it's overlaid onto a heat map of glint as a proportion of the total amount of light that would be directed toward the heron um, at that orientation. So in yellow, we have a high glint, high proportions of glint, and in blue, we have low proportions of glint. And then what I did was I extracted um, information about the glint at each one of those data points and then compared them with glint at a randomized set of data points and found, again, that there was no difference. So this lends further support to the idea that parents are not using body orientation to mitigate glint. Now, that was really perplexing to me. Um, but I decided to go after, uh, or to review, really, a 40-year-old hypothesis about head tilting in herons. So head tilting is this behavior right here. And Krebs and Partridge, well, I should say it was first described by Bayeriex back in the 60s. Um, in the 70s, Krebs and Partridge hypothesized that herons would tilt their heads and necks toward the sun in order to shift glint on the water surface outside of their strike zone. And we can think of this as akin to sitting at home and having the reflection of whatever it is, a window, in our field of view, in front of whatever we're trying to watch. In this case, we would do exactly what the herons do, but, well, what the herons were hypothesized to do without thinking about it. So in this case, we would move our heads toward the light source. And when we do that, the glint shift, uh, shifts out, of, out from in front of what we're trying to look at. Okay. So because herons are, or were said, to head tilt toward the sun almost all of the time, um, this hypothesis was very intuitive. It was intuitively attractive, uh, widely accepted. Um, and, but also it means that we can make predictions on where the heron should strike following the head tilt, right? So at high sun, and I should say, when the sun is directly overhead, that's really the only time that the heron cannot head tilt toward the sun, right? Um, so at high sun, um, if the heron, the heron would experience glint very near to its body, right? So right in front of it. And if it head tilts, 
the gland will shift off in the same direction as the head bone, right? And then it should appear, generally speaking, to strike toward where the glint was before it moved its head, all right? So it should appear to strike away from the direction of the head tilt at high sun. And that's in contrast to when the sun is low in the sky, the glint is already shifted, in this case, to the uh, left of the heron's body over there. And so when it head tilts toward the sun, the glint is shifted off further toward the sun, but it still should appear to strike toward the area that it was looking at before, before the glint was in its way. All right, so it should appear to strike toward the direction of the head tilt. So in order to test these predictions, <laughs> to test the linked hypothesis for head tilting, I went to Southern Florida. Um, we filmed free living herons from three angles simultaneously. Uh, these are GoPro cameras. They're 120 frames per second. And we filmed them both in baited buckets as well as in their natural environments, if you will. We got about 60 analyzable head tilts, meaning um, 60 head tilts that were caught from the three, the three cameras simultaneously. And it's actually harder than it, it would seem. <laughs> um, and, um, and that was from about 20 individuals. So the reason we get three simultaneous views is that we want to be able to um, digitally track the positions of the herons head in space, in three-dimensional space, as it's head tilting. So for example, uh, we might plot the tip of the bill in this picture, and then in the same uh, frame, but in another view, plot the tip of the bill again and again. And when we have this plotted in three views, we can triangulate the exact position of that point in space relative to the cameras. Now, you can imagine that we can do this again at the base of the bill, in order to then have two points, we can create a line from those two points, and then we can use trigonometry to figure out the orientation of the head or the neck or the body in three-dimensional space. So here I'm going to show you a video of a great egret head tilting at quarter speed. And here's a little blue heron, also head tilting at quarter speed. Now the interesting thing I want to note about this video, oh, and it was successful. That's <laughs> All right. So the interesting thing to note about the video is where it's head tilting. You see it's head tilting toward its shadow, right? That means it's head tilting opposite to the sun. Well, that was really interesting. And in fact, it turns out that herons seem to do this more often than we predicted. <laughs> so here we have a graph of body orientation with respect to the sun by neck orientation with respect to the sun. And I realize that's a lot of orientation, so it's a little tricky, but the take home message is that everything below y equals x means the heron was head tilting toward the sun relative to its body orientation. And you may notice that that leaves quite a few points out here on the other side of that line. Um, perplexing. Um, I am asked almost every time I give this portion of this talk, well, what about strike success? And just so that we're clear, strike success is not different on either side of that line either. Anyhow, just because herons are not always head tilting toward the sun, doesn't mean that we can't still test predictions, or our original predictions, based on uh, those herons that were doing what we expected. All right, so we went ahead and did that. And so here I'm gonna show you um, sun elevation on the x-axis again by strike bearing relative to the head tilt on the y-axis. And you may recall that we predicted at low sun elevation, herons would strike toward the direction, excuse me, of the head tilt. And at high sun elevation, we predicted that they would be um, more likely to strike away from the direction of the head tilt. And what this would do is um, allow us to make some sort of binomial regression to fit that um, data there. So I'll show you the data. 
Hmm. <laughs> 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 All right. So, <laughs> yeah, that didn't work out the way I thought it would. Um, but anyhow, um, interesting note about this graph is that herons are mostly just striking away from the direction of the uh, excuse me, from the direction of the head tilt here. <coughs> So again, we said, all right, well now, you know what? We have three-dimensional or uh, yeah, three-dimensional orientation information for the heron's head. So we can go back and estimate glint prior to and during the head tilt for these herons um, and, and get much better estimates than we did just using body orientation. So we went ahead and did that here on the axis. We have, um, laser is not working with me here. Um, we have prior to the head tilt and during the head tilt, and on the y-axis we have glint proportion. Um, and I'm going to show you, well, you may recall, um, that what we would predict, right, so if head tilting is for mitigating glint, we would predict that there would be lower glint experienced by the, head, the heron during the head tilt than before. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so well, that's not what we found. Um, and, you know, that leaves us with a couple of things, right? We still learned something from that. We learned that parents are not using body orientation to mitigate glint. Um, and we also have evidence that they're not using head tilting to mitigate glint. And that leaves us with two questions, well, left me with two questions, and that is, how are they mitigating glint? And two is, what on earth is the purpose of head tilting? <laughs> so for the remainder of my dissertation, I focus on that second question. So I got to thinking, well, what about refraction? Refraction is a major visual challenge that they're dealing with. So when the heron sees this fish here, um, the photons that have reflected off of that fish are going to bend outward once they um, exit the water, as in the water, and that's going to cause that fish to appear further out than it actually is. Now, I got to pretending that I was a heron. <laughs> <laughs> I got out a Tupperware, filled it with water, threw a penny in there, penny was a fish, <laughs> and I, the heron, if you will, were, I, I was the pencil, all right? So the pencil was my head and my bill. And I started trying to stab at the penny. And doing this visually, of course, you strike, you, you know, you, you overshoot the penny every time. Then I started playing around with the light source behind me. Now, you can, you know, if you have the light source out here and your pen or your pencil is not oriented just so, you, you uh, end up with this kind of long pencil looking shadow out here. However, if you align your pencil just right, you can get what I call a point shadow right over this penny. And then, using that orientation of the pencil, I would strike at the penny and found that I could consistently hit it. So, I got to thinking, well, maybe herons are doing this too. All right, so, if the heron can align its head uh, all the way from the back of its head through its bill in just the right way with the sun, creating a shadow over the apparent location of the prey, then it would be aligned with the real location of the prey. So to do this, we test, or excuse me, to test this prediction, to test the uh, refraction hypothesis for head tilting, we had to uh, understand, you know, what is the angle between the heron's head and the sun during each head tilt. So we'll call that angle alpha, and we can use uh, relatively standard three-dimensional trigonometry in order to multiply vectors to get this angle. All right, so here uh, vector H is for the heron, uh, the heron's head, and the vector S is the vector created by the sun. Um, we don't really care about the magnitude of the sun's vector because all we're interested in is uh, just the angular component of this, um, of this equation. So, we simplify that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 
So, and then we can, of course, calculate alpha by just taking the inverse cosine of all that. All right, so for the, for the head tilting um, for refraction hypothesis, we would always expect alpha to be zero, right, if it's an exact alignment with the sun. So I'm going to show you a graph of sun elevation, again, on the x-axis, by alpha on the y-axis. And again, here's what we predict. It should look like it's all at zero. And you probably know what's going to happen. <laughs> So <laughs> this is not at all zero. And in fact, alpha was never zero, right? Mm -hmm. So we have good evidence, at the very least, that they are not even thinking about correcting for refraction with their shadows. All right. All right, and that got me thinking again, uh, what else could it be? What else are herons dealing with? They're dealing with um, being viewed by their prey. So if you remember Snell's window, if you remember fish can see <laughs> almost everything in the terrestrial hemisphere. And if you take a look at Snell's window, a schematic of Snell's window from the side, what we have here is uh, each one of these gray um, dash lines and these gray lines um, represent paths of photons. And what we have here is, again, all of the light from the terrestrial hemisphere <laughs> is being compressed into a 97 degree cone because of refraction. And interesting note is that light coming from straight or straight up, all right, perpendicular to the water surface, cannot be bent downward any further once it hits the water, right? It's going to go straight, straight down. But the light coming from out here is going to be bent substantially. And the consequence of this that when you look at Snell's window, and you can do this, you can dive to the bottom of a pool and look up, what you'll see is that the image in the center of Snell's window is relatively clear, where the image at the edge of Snell's window is pretty darn distorted. So you can imagine that if you're a heron, a bird with a long neck and you're pretty tall, you might be very visible to a fish. You might be visible in their Snell's window if you're standing upright. But, oh, causing the, the fish to flee. But, <laughs> <laughs> if you head tilt, you may be able to put your most predatory looking parts, right, your head, your bill, at the edge of Snell's window from the perspective of that fish. And that may allow the heron to avoid being detected. And I should note here, Remember, I showed you the graph before that herons are almost always striking away from the direction of the head tilt, which is consistent with this hypothesis too. All right, so in order to test the uh, detection avoidance hypothesis for head tilting, I needed access to a place where I could conduct some controlled experiments, look at fish behaviors um, uh, in response to herons that are upright, and head tilted. Of course, uh, the Burlington uh, trout hatchery, um, they were wonderful. They allowed me to use some of your, their raceways, and I'll talk about that more in a second. But you can imagine they didn't want me exposing their fish to herons. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we ended up using decoy, a, a model, uh, a, a robotic heron decoy. And FYI, Robo Heron will be available in the grad student lounge this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we had access to four raceways, and they did look like this. So someone asked me, well, what about case, or raceways two and three? They were adjacent to one another. All right. So four raceways, each stocked with a little over 7,000 uh, finger sized brown trout. And they had opaque screens on one end of the raceway for access to shelter. And then we installed a um, clothesline pulley system overhead along with two GoPros that we could then use the pulley system to maneuver over the right raceway. And um, again, these were GoPros that were shooting at 120 frames per second. And we exposed the fish to the decoy on this side of the raceways. 
And in order to limit exposure, visual exposure of the other fish and other raceways to robo heron, we used blinds. Okay, so this is uh, robo heron here. Robo heron is um, on a remote controlled car, one sense scale, just with the body taken off. And on it is mounted a lift that was made out of PVC piping and a winch kit. And then we mounted this um, decoy. It's just a regular lawn ornament off eBay or something. We cut off, <laughs> we cut off the neck. Uh, we mounted it to a swiveling device in order that we could put it in both head tilting and upright positions. And, um, oh, no, I should say one more thing about that. And that is that we then rolled Robo Heron to the raceway of interest um, where we had uh, four white markers here so we knew where to roll Robo Heron to. Um, this was imperative because you know, we don't want the fish to be exposed to us, right? Mm -hmm. So we rolled them out, out to where the correct, um, um, I guess, well, marker was. And then we lifted Robo Heron above the lip of each raceway. <laughs> so we had three treatments. Control, um, I should mention the control treatment was just the car plus the lift without the, the decoy mounted on top. So in the control, we predicted that we would not see evidence of flight response um, in these treatments and that fish would not be you know, more likely to swim forward or, or away from the control object. However, in the upright treatments, we predicted that if uh, herons were, were um, uh, responding to the upright decoy as a predator, that they would flee farthest and most quickly away from that decoy. And that's as opposed to the head tilting decoy. Now we had two predictions actually for the head tilting decoy. And that is one, if head tilting is 100% effective, it should look exactly like the control. But if it is not 100% effective, we might see some sort of an intermediate response. So here is an overhead view of the raceway. We've got Robo Heron over here, well, one of the raceways, Robo Heron, and then each one of these little black lines is one of the brown trout. We digitized the movements of 10 fish that were nearest to 10 randomly generated XY coordinates in the first two meters of uh, Robo Heron. And each one of these points is the location of a fish um, every 50 frames. So we, we digitize them every 50 frames for 2,000 frames. And here's an example of a fish trajectory. And another one. Those ones went long. <laughs> that one did a swizzle. <laughs> and there's one that may get selected out. I don't know. That one. Went <laughs> 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 All right. Um, but an important note is that there weren't always 10 fish within the first two meters of Robo Heron. So we did have to control for initial group size in our statistical <coughs> models. And that's important because fish are schooling. Uh, well, these are schooling species, and we know that that affects their behavior. So first I'm gonna show you maximum speeds of fish um, for control, head tilting, and upright decoys. And Remember, we predicted that, uh, that fish would be most fast or most quickly from the upright heron. And we thought we might see something like this for the control in the head, the, the head tilting treatment, or possibly something like that. Well, I've got bad news for you. <laughs> <I know. laughs> however, however, in spite of maximum speeds not being different, we may have something more interesting on your hands or on our hands. So here is a graph of total distance from initial position and um, by frame number, so essentially by time, right? And above the zero line, 
means that the fish were swimming away from the decoy or the control, and below the zero line, they were swimming toward the decoy or the control. So I'll show you the control now. And just to orient you a little bit, so again, each one of these points was where a fish was every 50 frames. And then this would be, for example, you know, a trajectory of one fish. All right. And what you notice for these trajectories is that um, there's a lot of variance, yes, but there is a very dense part of this plot right here along the zero line. And so we're going to use this control to compare to the head tilting and upright trials for treatments. And there's our upright. So visually, you can see that fish are more likely to swim away from the decoy. And the upright 95% uh, confidence interval does not intersect zero. So that's exciting, right? Fish might be actually interpreting the, the uh, upright decoy as a predator. And here's what we see with head tilting. Right. So um, again, well, you can visually see, right? So a lot different from the upright. There's not so much, um, there's not so many dots up here and the confidence interval does intersect with zero. Not by much, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> All right, and now here's a um, interesting but frustrating bit for me, the head tilting and the upright trials are the confidence intervals for that. Did it overlap with each other? All right, so what does this mean? It means that we could not tell a difference between fish, uh, ending distance of fish in the head tilting versus upright trials, but we also couldn't tell the difference between fish ending distances in the head tilting versus control trials. And I would suggest to you that this is evidence that I should pursue this question further. It may be the beginning lines of evidence for the detection and avoidance hypothesis for head tilting, which is pretty exciting to me. <laughs> so where does that leave us? Right. Again, we found out that herons are not avoiding glints, or we have evidence that herons are not avoiding glints with body orientation or with head tilting. We have evidence that they're not using head tilting to correct for refraction. And we have some evidence that they may be using head tilting to avoid detection via visual properties of Snell's window. And where does this leave me? Well, you may recall that I used hatchery fish. Um, they, were, they were bred from wild stock, but there is still evidence that hatchery fish have muted anti-predator responses than wild fish. So in the future, I'm hoping to conduct more experiments to uh, pursue this line of questioning about the detection avoidance hypothesis for head tilting using wild, um, wild fish. Further, I'm really interested in the puzzle of how herons are mitigating glint. And so I am pursuing um, an opportun well, opportunities, really, to study retinal anatomy. And so I've already, well, we, we're we at an ag school, right? <laughs> we have an ag school. <laughs> so I've gotten an opportunity to um, compare a chicken uh, to a heron retinal already, and I'm looking forward to pursuing this line of questioning further. Right. And with that, I, um, I just hope you never look at the air-sea interface and the, the animals that um, hunt there the same ever again. I do want to thank a few people. Um, Emmanuel Marte, who's back there. <laughs> um, my first undergrad assistant ever helped me do some preliminary uh, filming in the field. And we didn't have a whole lot of success. Those parents did not like us. <laughs> but it was very instructional. Um, Marie Mather, Katie Struth, who did a lot of digitizing of heron heads. And next, all right, and Mackenzie, who's also here somewhere. Yep, and Mackenzie and Keaton, who did a lot of digitizing of fish, two semesters worth of digitizing <laughs> fish. <laughs> All right, and uh, Judy, who's also here, 
uh, came all the way from Florida and she was my field assistant down in Florida. Uh, further, I roped my mom and my husband. <laughs> <laughs> my mom got to watch lots of herds in the field. My husband came down on like a 97 degree day and there was nobody foraging. He sat out there for hours. <laughs> <laughs> And um, Margaret, who has been um, just wonderful, she's a wonderful person and a wonderful advisor. I could not, could not have asked for a better mentor than Margaret um, in so many ways. Thank you so much. Um, my committee members, Eldridge, uh, Heidi, um, Eric, and Andy Moisef, have always been there. I ask people questions at all hours of the day. I've <laughs> um, always been available to um, either open their doors for me or, or um, been available by email to answer my random questions. Um, C. McKeon, my co-advisor at the Smithsonian, um, when we could not get herons to forage at this, you know, pool that we spent thousands of dollars trying to build. Mm. Between C and Margaret, they encouraged me to keep going. I really thought I was going to fail out of grad school. Oh. <laughs> I was very scared. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, but they were so encouraging. Um, Aaron, uh, Aaron Cooperwitz, Ana Ibarra, Ignacio Escalante Mesa uh, were my instructors at the OCS program. Um, and I want to thank the entire OCS crew because that's where I really started to envision myself as a scientist as opposed to a, an educator who's kind of impersonating a scientist, if you will. Um, so I really am uh, so appreciative of them. Ty Hedrick at UNC, who uh, taught me um, about digitizing and 3D, uh, three-dimensional um, reconstruction. Uh, Anthony Rizzi, who's also here, um, uh, taught me about three-dimensional trigonometry. Raul Kanadia gave me access to all his laboratory equipment and. Um, and guided me through extracting and mounting retinas, bird retinas. Yukon Ornithology Group, you read bajillions of grant proposals and manuscripts and gave wonderful feedback, and I just can't thank you enough. You're all fantastic. And I wanna thank a subset of you even further um, just for uh, just remarkable advice that they gave over the years. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, um, Brandon Russell, um, William Ryerson, Kurt Schwenk helps me to think about a lot of these ideas as well. And they're outside of the ornithology group. Um, as you know, our BCS and uh, EEB staff, um, and, and Joan Kaminsky is a, a Smithsonian um, administrative staff, uh, they were just wonderful. I don't know how many, you know, again with the questions, I don't know how many questions that I've loved these people with, but they were just always patient to help me to get, um, you know, get where I was going. Um, collection staff, uh, just wonderful people, and it's just a pleasure to work with you. Um, staff at the Burlington Trout Hatchery, um, so, <laughs> so patient <laughs> and, um, and just wonderful and excited about the project. Um, uh, Nick McIntosh, Verge Cask, Brian Cruz. Uh, Nick, of course, you know, I mean, my computer is going crazy. It's like seven and a half years old. And this Nick, wonderful man, just, you know, I'm talking to my computer like, come on, you just have to get me through grad school. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Nick's there to help. Um, Verge and Brian uh, helped or did some of the uh, illustrations in my presentation today. They're fantastic. Um, a lot of technical assistance from Sarah James, uh, Peter Glaudy, and, and uh, Matt Drobny are in UConn Technical Services. Um, they did a lot of uh, help, you know, with just thinking about, well, how the heck are we going to do a robo heron and, and really made it come together. Woody Lee and Sherry Reed um, at Smithsonian helped with technical aspects there. And then I just thank all of my wonderful friends. I'm not going to go through these by name. I'm running out of time here. But I just thank um, all of these wonderful people. Without you, grad school would not have been bearable. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's just, you know, it's a lot of work. It's really tedious and it's hard sometimes, but it's also wonderful. Um, thank you to the department for having me.
This dissertation is dedicated to the educators who never give up on people. Thank you. Good question. So herons do have um, some binocular overlap, both in front of their bill and beneath their chin. So you can actually see. Uh, I should have done the slide. Are they so many pictures? Yeah. So um, they they have, but um, about well, I shouldn't say they. Um, the work wasn't done with great blue herons. It was done with reef herons, I believe. Uh, but they had about 20 or 30 degrees of binocular overlap. But did it change the plot that way? Did it change the plot that way? There's more of their overlap. But they can see them as the overlap, right? But it's too much. So when they do that, is the part of the overlap? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, okay, so I, I guess two, two directions. Go in my response and to keep me on track um, if I'm not, you know, answering your question. Well, I don't understand that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So there are, um, and in fact, there's a number of labs doing this. There are labs that um, you know are able to project visual fields out into space and monitor, um, you know, what animals are are looking at. Um, in order to do that, you do actually need to map out the well, for good resolution, you need to map out the retinal cells, um, uh, which we just don't have for most herons. Um, but the other thing is, you know, so you said, well, maybe are they trying to see a fish? And um, I guess there's a part A and B to that question too. So they're, again, they're often striking away from the direction of head tilt when they do that behavior. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that they're, they're looking on something that's on this side if they're striking in this direction. And the other thing um, is that they have another behavior called head cocking, which I didn't show, <clears throat> but it's actually on the beginning of that first head tilt video. Uh, so the heron in that first head tilt video, um, it was a great egret actually. What it does is it cocks, if you will, the first six vertebrae and looks down like this. But then, it um, but then it actually does the entire neck tilt and strikes away from the direction of the head tilt. And I say that to say that there are several birds that have kind of two, um, well, we'll call them areas of specialization um, in on their retinas. One is usually central, and the other uh, projects into well, it's temporal, so it projects into the binocular area. And so the idea, um, well, the hypothesis, right, is that <laughs> the hypothesis is that they're using those two behaviors for different things, that they're doing the head cocking to use maybe some sort of central phobia or a central area of retinal specialization to, um, you know, identify prey and then, um, yeah, and then maybe, yeah, and then uh, look for movement in their binocular fields. Is that yeah, okay. Very important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, did you take any special precautions to make sure that like mostly herons came to your like testing sites or was it just like uh like did you just bait it with some random sort of bait? Uh, so this is my little brother by the way. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, yeah, so we we 
there were no special precautions, if you will. Um, uh, we used uh, some store-bought bait, and then I actually had a video in here. Um, in, in the course of doing this, I realized that bait was expensive. Aww. So I bought a cast net and learned, well, I was taught how to cast net. I got, <laughs> I got pretty good at it until I threw my cast net into an oyster bed. But alas, the <laughs> um, <laughs> point of that is, no, so there were no, no special precautions. And in fact, we do have footage of other birds um, taking our bait. So we have some gulls and I think even a grapple. For that <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Elizabeth. Um, so in your robo-fish experiment, so you were saying you're disappointed that it's not going to overlap. Yeah. Um, it's still really striking that there's a whole bunch of red conjecture that are outside the range of the blue. And so I feel like maybe there's, maybe there's something more going on there that you can't pull out with additional information. Yeah, you know, I was thinking, yeah, that's a good, it's a good point. Um, I was thinking about that too, and that's certainly something that I'll think about um, going into um, you know, before I submit this to a journal. Um, it's yeah. Symmetry in the blue. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I want to see a pattern. I know. <laughs> I know. I want to see it. Yeah. Um, sure. And then the second question, uh, all of the field observations, it sounds like they're across multiple species. Uh, so in, in the first, um, so in the body orientation experiment, uh, well, not experiment, sorry, in the body orientation study, um, there were great egrets and great blue herons. So they're in the same genus, um, but yeah, so there's two species. So is there enough information to start to look at whether there's any variation in behavior across species? Because sometimes that can give you a clue to what the behavior is actually for. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's, a, that's also a good point. Um, I think that I need to increase my sample size to get a better look at that. Um, but yeah, also something that I that I would be interested in. Yeah. Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Um, so knowing very little about how to age birds for a while, but did you find any variation in the protein behavior according to the bird? Is it some kind of learned behavior that they're getting better at as they gain more experience? You know, so <laughs> another good question. Um, I don't think, you know, to my to my knowledge, people haven't really done studies of how parents learn um, foraging behavior. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly a good question. Like I know in in brown pelicans, older birds dive at more perpendicular angles to the water surface than than uh, than year old birds, um, you know. But there's always the question of are the the young birds that are you know doing it wrong, if you will, are they being selected out, right? And it's just the ones who are doing it right are are um, moving on to adulthood, um, or are they actually learning? So I mean, it's it's a it's a great question. Um, something that may be difficult to pursue. Um, I mean, yeah, no, it would be something that would be interesting to pursue if I can uh, use like marked, marked birds. Um, but yeah. Okay, if we don't have other pressing questions, given the time, we should uh, wrap this up. Um, and thank Holly for her presentation. Holly is moving in now for a lesson directly to a meeting with her committee in uh, the Bamford Room in the Corey Biological Sciences building, other faculty who are interested in attending that portion of the exam are welcome. Um, for everyone else pending a successful defense with her committee, there is going to be a 
gathering for Holly on the third floor of the Corey Life Science building this afternoon. So 